Starship Star Vexer. Its eternal mission to explain this mind where no mind has gone before. We are now about to engage Starship Star Vexer. I am your host, Bill Demery. And Today's show with Joanne and Jimmy Moriarty will reveal more truth than most people will be able to handle. Please listen to the very end. Some of this information is overwhelming, but you must hear it all. And I am so honored and proud to call them true friends. Their life experiences are what I believe no one has ever experienced. Jimmy was very wealthy with a business with million-dollar contracts with Libya. The government, Hillary Clinton, Obama, decided that they were going to destroy. They reached a point where they were homeless and living in the streets in this country after what they experienced in Libya, and they were captured by al-Qaeda. Now, these two lovely people are perhaps the only people that ever escaped from al-Qaeda, and that was due to at least three miracles, which got them safe back to our country. And as for safe back in our country, you can't classify it as safe because the government has soft-killed Jimmy and Joanne, which means they have played dirty tricks. They destroyed his company. They took away their bank accounts, their homes, and left them in a state where the dirty tricks being played on them included having drugs planted on their vehicle. And luckily, another little miracle, one of the mechanics that were working on their vehicle stole the drugs so that when the police approached them, there were no drugs in their vehicle. They were living on the income from selling CDs, and when the CDs arrived early, Jimmy threw one of them into the video player, and it was pornography. Jimmy contacted the CD producer, and the gentleman says, we don't produce pornography, and the shipment had arrived early, so Jimmy got in touch with one of his uh, really good security friends, etc., and asked, what should I do? And His friend told him, uh, shred those CDs. And sure enough, the police showed up to bust Jimmy for distributing pornography. Well, that's basically the crib notes. And Jimmy and Joanne were there. They saw the torture. They saw the bloodshed. They saw the beheadings. They saw the Toyota trucks coming into the port. And the reason they are still alive today is because their intel in Libya is better than the CIA or the Mossad's intel. Joanne and Jimmy will tell you how they managed to get out with, I think it was 200 gigabytes of information, but I'm sure they will straighten me up on that. And the reason I know so much about these lovely people is we have become very good and very close friends, as well as I've interviewed them before on my other radio show, and we talk quite a bit. So Jimmy and Joanne, thank you so very much for spending this time with me, and I hope I didn't intrude too much on your story, and I hope I got all the facts right. So, Jimmy and Joanne, how are you today? Great. Lovely introduction. Thank yeah. You. The, the, a couple of points. Our contracts in Libya were in the billions, not millions. Quite substantial. We actually lost $200 million uh, when that place was blown up. So we had, a, we had established a very, very substantial world-class operation in Libya. So, you know, that was pretty devastating in its first place. The second thing, Joanne has been my my business partner and associate and wife and confidant and everything for all of this time. So nothing that nothing is, is mine, it's ours. And Joanne was actually responsible for bringing this technology forward and has been, has, we are the sole marketing team and everything. We have a, a staff used to have a big staff. They've all been put on on stipend and retirement, forced retirement, uh, because we lost everything in Libya. But uh, the technology, yeah, the technology is is there, and it's it's still world class. We don't have any peers in that. But we've been blocked 
by this government. We've been soft killed and blacklisted and we have been precluded, aggressively precluded from doing any business. So the reason we're in such dire straits is not because of anything that, that uh, is explainable. It's because of the deep state and the, we're the attacks. And we, we've been targeted, as you said. And fortunately, we've been uh, protected by the good Lord and, and by God's mercy so many times. It happens all the time. All the dirty tricks, you mentioned a couple of them, but they have been nonstop in dirty tricks trying to to stop us and block us. You know, the latest one really did a seminar in, in Dallas a few months back, and some bad guys were in the hotel we were in. They were following us around. They did a bump and run, tried to kill Joanne, knocking her off of a balcony that would have dropped her about 30 foot to hard, sharp surfaces. And, and again, she was protected and, and was able to grab a rail and ended up only breaking a couple of teeth, which is not good. Very, very painful deal. But, uh, you know, these things, when you've got the government after you, it's kind of tough to to imagine. But Well, it's really the dark, the deep state that's after us. It's yeah. it's. Uh, it's the CIA, the dark part of the CIA and the, the people that, that destroyed Libya, that um, we happened to be there. As you know, Bill, we were there from 2011 doing business off and on in Libya. 2007. Excuse me, 2007 in Libya, January 2007 in the oil and gas industry. And when this mess started over in, in Libya, uh, we were contacted by a fact-finding commission, a non-governmental fact-finding commission. Uh, it's a... Um, youth organization with two billion members worldwide who asked us to go to Libya with another with a group of people. They weren't all Americans. They were uh, we were the only Americans, actually. They, they were from England, from Italy, from Pakistan, from Africa, everywhere to, to please go to Libya and see the truth about what was happening, because none of the truth was being reported in the media. And we we agreed to go and. We ended up in Tripoli in 2011 in May, and we were trapped there until September 1st. So we were we were actually eyewitnesses to all the war crimes that were committed, all the horrible crimes against humanity that were committed in that country, and the lies. That was a complete false flag. There was never a revolution in Libya. It was all a lie. There were 250,000 mercenaries that were brought into that country to destroy it, and NATO bombed 60,000 sorties into that country, destroying uh, water supplies, power supplies, homes, schools, food, the hotel, everything you can imagine. They bombed everything. Because the people of Libya were not, they were not for any kind of revolution. They were happy. They, uh, Gaddafi had about a 85 to 90 percent approval of all the people. There were some, there was a real small pocket of, of radical dissidents that every country has, but those people were, uh, radical Islam was not flourishing in Libya. It was not acceptable in Libya, not allowed in Libya. If you had a long beard and mustache, you were really uh, ostracized. You couldn't move up in in government. You you know, he had trouble getting a job and everything because uh, Libya was really a a, uh, country that protected all religions. If your religion was based on a book, then you were protected. And our first trip in there, we met with a, a Catholic bishop that had been in Libya for 40 years. He had started off in Benghazi, and then he had moved to Tripoli. And uh, his rectory, the doors were left unlocked, big church doors left unlocked. And he said he was actually protected by the government, never lost anything, never had any trouble with anybody. And uh, there was a, a fairly large Catholic presence, but it was mainly from doctors and nurses and clinicians and stuff that were there for the medical industry. But uh, Libya was a closed shop. It had, it, it had about 350,000 foreigners a year into Libya. And most of those people were workers in the oil and gas industry. So it was, it really had no tourism. It had been embargoed since uh, when? Whenever Lockerbie took place, which was a lie, Lockerbie was, was done by the CIA and that's been proven by many whistleblowers. But, Libya was embargoed by the West. They couldn't, people couldn't travel there. People couldn't travel out of there. There's a lot of things that they did, nasty things to Libya. They've been doing them for years. But everybody should know that Gaddafi was not the official leader of the country at the time it was blown up. Gaddafi had been required to step down from leadership in 2006 by the treaty he signed with Condoleezza Rice, required him to step down if they were going to open Libya again, and he did that. Plus, Libya had to get rid of half of its military it had to get rid of all of its offensive weapons. 
and it had to completely dismantle its nuclear enrichment program, which it agreed to, and it did. In fact, Chris Stevens' first endeavor in Libya was, was as a member of the UN group that was uh, overseeing the dismantling of the, of the nuclear system in Libya. So that was the first treaty. So Libya was being, nobody knew it then, but Libya was being set up at that time to be taken over. So this was a long-term plan to destroy Libya. The second treaty that Libya signed was in 2009, and the criminal traitor uh, John McCain and Lindsey Graham, uh, three U.S. politicians were there. The second treaty was signed by Libya, and Libya had to reduce its military by another 50%. It had to get rid of all its defensive weapons. And Libya agreed to that under the condition that if Libya was invaded, the United States would step forward to protect it. Little did Libya know the U.S. was going to be the, the invader. In, invader, you know. That was a real dirty trick. There was no, there was no civil war in Libya. The, Why was Libya invaded? Yeah, you know, the, the reason, number one reason Libya was invaded and blown up is because Gaddafi had started the African bank, and that was gold-backed currency for the continent of Africa. All the Arab countries had signed up as members, and half of Africa had signed up as members. And a gold-backed currency with the resources of Africa behind it would have completely destroyed the petrodollar, the, petrodollar, the fiat bankers, the Rothschild, Rockefeller, Medici, Clinton, Bush cartel that uh, have basically destroyed the world and taken over the world with their false God being money, and it's and the money is, is toilet paper. There's nothing behind it. There's 85 men in the world that own at least 70% of everything, and they bought it all with toilet paper because they had, the, they had the key to the printing press, if you would, for dollars, euros. In fact, all the, the, all the, the central banks in the world were owned by the Zionists. And I want you to, I want your audience to differentiate between Zionists and Jews. They are not the same, not even close. The Zionists are the old Khazarian mafia. They were the, the tribe that Jesus threw out of the temple as money changers. Their homeland was originally the Ukraine area. And uh, they have been criminal money dealers and Satanists for thousands of years. And one of the Russian czars was so tired of them constantly causing problems that he, he lined them up one day and he said, he said, you all are either going to get religion, become members of the human race, or else we're going to eliminate you down to the last piece of your bloodline. Still robbing and and they, they could choose any religion they want, but they had to join it, follow it, everything. So they chose the, the Jewish religion, I guess, because there were fewer members there or whatever. And that's how the Jewish religion is, has been co-opted by these bad guys. And, and yes, so, the last time I interviewed you, I mentioned that Libya was a virtual paradise. Uh, and you can go into details of how he treated his people and what he did with his money. But I could not remember the name of a, of the gentleman that produced the video where there were perhaps a million people in the streets of Libya dancing with their flags overhead, proud to be Libyans. And that was Webster Tarpley. And you told me that you gave Webster Tarpley a ride. And I also wish that, you know, you would go into detail about the miracles that got you out of there and the horrors you did see. Uh, and my audience is very, very well aware of the difference between the, the Jews, the Zionists, the Kasarian, and it's just that that's preaching to the choir. Okay. But there are a few, there are a few people that still oh, don't true. know the truth. And yeah, when they start labeling you a, what is that word? A anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic. Yes. Uh, a Semite. Yeah. And, and the truth is uh, anti-Semite refers to many of the tribes uh, which are in that area now. Well, Libya was, when we went there, we were very trepidatious. We didn't know what to expect because, of course, we had seen all the publicity about how Libya was this and Libya was that. And when we got there, it was exactly the opposite. We had a, a team of four security people, great big mountain men, you know, that were there to protect us from the bad guys in Libya. Uh, there when we got any. there, no, there weren't any. <laughs> there weren't After any. two days, I sent them home. And Joanne and I were able to walk the streets of Tripoli 
in in a safer posture than we could in Houston or any place in the United States. And what we learned about Libya is the money wasn't really Gaddafi's. This was he was he lived in a tent. Now it was a five star tent, but but he was not anybody that really usurped the wealth of the country. The the country operated on about 49% of its income. The rest of it was distributed out to the people. And the way they did that, when a couple got married, they received a $46,000 gift from the government to start their lives. The first car you bought in Libya cost you half of dealer invoice. Gasoline was 44 cents a gallon for a, like a 93 octane fuel. Your house, the government was in 2011 when NATO blew it up. Libya was building 620,000 new condominiums. These were homes of 2,000 square feet to about 2,800 square feet. When you bought one of those, you paid 10% of your salary for 20 years and then it was yours. No taxes. Uh, that was it. The there fuel no was, yeah, there was no tax in Libya. The, the gas and electricity were, were nothing. Free medical, uh, free education. In fact, the medical, if you could not receive the medical care you needed in Libya, then the government would pay for you and a family member to travel anywhere in the world to get that treatment with all expenses paid for the medical treatment and your expenses, etc. Your education. The government would pay for you to be educated anywhere in the world and pay you a stipend along with that. There was a young man getting his doctorate in England. He was paid uh, 4,500 pounds a month on top of all of his school costs. He had a wife and three kids. That was about 7,500, five kids. Five kids. Yeah. That was about $7,500 a month at the time. <laughs> When you had a new baby, the government gave you a five thousand dollar gift. All education was free. Yeah, as and far as your mind at, would take you. Yeah, at their the equivalent of Christmas, uh, every man, woman, and child in Libya got a five hundred dollar gift from the government. They had food warehouses all over the country, and without any ID or anything, if you went to one of those warehouses and you told them you needed food then they would give you 50 kilos of rice, 50 kilos of flour, a uh, bunch of cheese, milk, other products, and then enough money for you to buy an animal to be slaughtered for your family. And you could come back the next day and they'd do it again. There was no questions asked. So the people, there was no starvation. There was Libya, no debt. Libya employed about 2 million uh, Africans in, in their country. Those people, most of them, they were all treated very well, but they all supported their families inside other countries in Africa. And when this war started, they were sent to uh, camps outside of Libya. And we stopped at one of those camps on the Tunisian border, and they were being treated horribly by the UN or whoever was running those camps. Those this people, was running those people were so country. angry. They surrounded us. They said, <laughs> why is your country doing this? Libya was a wonderful place. We were happy there. Why you have ruined our lives? Why is your country doing this? They were really angry. And Libya was the barricade that the Gaddafi actually and the Libyans were were buffering the African people and keeping them, if you the would, out of problems. out of Europe. And uh, also, I wanted to add that the women were emancipated in the 1970s by Gaddafi. He did not believe in any of the Sharia stuff that that goes on. People talk about with Islam, women didn't have to wear any kind of uh, clothing. In fact, he didn't even like the headscarves. He preferred they didn't wear them. The women wore them in Libya more as a fashion statement, I think, than anything. But he encouraged women to get educations, to start businesses. They were in the military. Libya was, the women in Libya were very strong. And it's one of the reasons that Hillary Clinton and Obama and all of them that wanted to destroy the country had such a terrible time and still have not conquered that country inside the tribes or anything because of the strength of those women in Libya. And the men, of course, too. But in places like Saudi Arabia, women are so oppressed, they have no voice. They can do nothing. Women in Libya drove. They were. We worked with a, one of their lead attorneys, which was a woman, while we were there in 2011. She's still working, taking her case, wants to take her case to world courts. So uh, Libya was an amazing place. Of course, they did have, and I wanted to add, too, before, before the 1969 uh, al-Fatah revolution, the coup that overthrew the old despot king that was installed by England in Libya. Libya never had any kings. When he when he just ran off because the Libyan tribes uh, were going to throw him out, and they appointed Gaddafi as as the leader. Libya went from the poorest country in Africa, where the average salary salary was 60 dinar a year, 
to the richest, most developed country in Africa in 40 years under Gaddafi. Their average salary was $15,800 a year, which was higher than India, higher than China. And Libya is not, not a small place. It's the seventh largest country in Africa, 17th largest in the world. But most of the people, very, very low population, they were six and a half million Libyans. Most of them live along the Mediterranean because the Sahara Desert starts in Libya and runs all the way through the, you know, 60, 70 percent of the country. But another lie that was has been put forward is that, that Gaddafi was bringing in mercenaries from Africa. And that's not true. Over 30 percent of the first class citizens in Libya were black. They were really the, the biggest agricultural producers. They raised chickens. They had a Big huge dairy industry. dairy industry, all kinds of agriculture. And by first class citizens, that means that their passport proved or indicated that they were residents of Libya, permanent residents of Libya prior to World War II. There were three classes of passports, and the third one was uh, people that came in, you know, in the last 10 years or whatever. But the blacks were, they were very, very prominent. In fact, Libya was a colorblind country. In every family, you saw every shade from white to black. There were uh, the races intermixed there, and they lived happily together and everything. So for the bad guys, the last thing they wanted to see was a prosperous country that was spreading the wealth out amongst all its people and people living in, in harmony, if you would. When, when they went in there uh, and started this false flag, one of the first things they did was they, uh, and openly in the media, they said they were going to cleanse Libya of, of blacks. And this was these are the Al Qaeda, ISIS, whatever you want to call them, the mercenaries that went in there, and they were they were talking about it openly, and they did. They raised uh, the five main black cities in Libya were raised. They were completely scraped to the ground. The Tawarga tribe, which is one of the big tribes in Libya, is a black tribe. They have been living homeless in in uh, containers and tents yeah. uh, since 2011, and many many blacks were were killed. In Libya, it was blamed on Gaddafi, but it wasn't happening by him. It was happening by the people who came into Libya. The, the Libyans, the do CIA, like Mossad, MI6 trained mercenaries that were taken in there, and they were paid to commit these horrendous acts. And you know, we found out later on that one of the main techniques used by the CIA when when they're training people to invade a country is the they're they're taught how to do these horrendous acts, chop people up, uh, rape the women, make people shocking, disappear. shocking acts. And that's so that people will lose their their will to, to fight. fight. Yeah. And that's one of their techniques. Well, you know, we're, we're talking about the CIA as being a part of the United States. No, it's not. The people of the United States would never would never go along with these horrendous acts that are committed by the evil empire, which is a 10 square mile area called Washington, D.C. That is the evil empire in the world. Parts of the CIA that are completely rogue. Yeah. Completely. And the other thing we, we learned, Joy and I, first of all, we were never activists. We were racehorses in the business world, but we were not political activists. In fact, we stayed out of the political arena because doing business worldwide, we let the, the local uh, associates, if you would, handle all the, the political involvement. In their and country. We, we did all our magic in our on our production laboratories and everything to make products that, that had no peers. But the thing we learned was the United States and the Mossad out of Israel and MI6 and the weapons the that they have been building since World War II have been predominantly depleted uranium warhead weapons. And the problem with depleted uranium, it's real hard material. It perforates you know, any kind of armor plating, everything like that. But uh, when it hits something hard, it explodes. And then these particles go into the soil and everything. And they they remain highly radioactive and emit their poison for, uh, you know, their half-life is like 50,000 years. So uh, if you go around the world and look at every place that the United States has, has sold their phony democracy, if you would, and you went in there with, with uh, gyre, counters. gyre counters, those places glow in the dark. And this was told to us by one of the Blackwater associates that was in there supposedly protecting a humanitarian that was in really look, looking at, at uh, locating and targeting the military bases in Libya. But 
He said, yeah, he said, you know, you, you don't want to go anywhere near the United States as Ben because all the kids and the dogs glow in the dark from the depleted uranium. So uh, these acts are specifically outlawed by all the international covenants and everything about about how war and uh, operations of war to be conducted. The United States th- absolutely throws those out. And it's terrible for me to talk about my country because we've been – loyal Americans, we've been patriots all our lives. And uh, the terrible thing, this is not the people of the United States. This is this little cabal of criminal traitors, Zionist uh, Satanists that occupy Washington, D.C. And a perfectly good man or woman is elected to office. They go to Washington, D.C., and they're converted into one of these evil people by drugs or, or coercion or blackmail or whatever. They get their kids on drugs and they have to become part of the, the group and then they uh, mysteriously uh, become gazillionaires overnight but they they go along with this this ploy so you know it's a real real bad situation but the evil empire that uh, if you remember reagan and margaret thatcher used to talk about that they pointed their finger at russia but no the evil empire is washington dc not the people of the united states and the disclosures that are coming out about what's happening and what has happened in our name is really making everybody disgusted. I'll, I'll give you some numbers about the results of, the, of these activities. Hey, I just I just wanted to say the first time I heard the Islamics say that we were the great Satan, I laughed and I thought, OK, these people have lost their minds. And as I woke up more and more and more, I got shivers down my spine, realizing one thing, the United States truly is the great Satan. It yeah. really, it really shook me to find out that my government, as, as it did you, was the great Satan. And until this day, I just, I, I want to make it up to the world, and that's one of the reasons I'm having you on my show. What, what yeah. I always say, Bill, is the U.S. is the proxy army. Oh of yeah, Satan, of the Satan. It's, it's not the USA, uh, the Constitution of the United States. It's USA Inc., which was actually put into full force and effect in 1871. You can go back to 1860 is when, when the constitutional United States began to be shifted into the USA Inc. And when Washington DC was formed, you know, uh, that is a, that was a criminal enterprise put forward by the criminal banksters, Rothschild, Rockefeller, Medici, the Vatican, etc. And the USA Inc. is not the legitimate, government of the United States. It's, it is a corporation formed and owned by the bad guys and all of us here in the United States believing that we've been operating under constitutional, under law, uh, we've been lied to and that's, that disclosure is coming forward. But the bad guys are the USA Inc., which the is a Zionist are. owned entity. And you know, the, the disclosures, the beautiful part about, about the time we're living in now is the disclosures that we saw with our own eyes and didn't understand all that, all those truths are coming forward. Like we used to talk about the, the 20,000 rockets, the shoulder to air mounted rockets that were delivered into Libya. Well, you know, the, the things that, that we used to say, we're going to begin, you know, like five, six years ago, we were talking about what we saw with our own eyes in Libya and people looked at us like we were smoking some high test rope or something because the things we said were so outlandish and so on. How could this be happening? You know, like the mass graves in Libya. We we were told there were 128 mass graves. These we saw three with our own eyes. They were about 50 foot long, about uh, 20 foot wide. We don't know how deep, completely full of bodies. Most of them black. That was never reported. We saw it with our own eyes and people said, oh, that can't be the case because there's only been, you know, 6,000 people killed in, in the whole fighting in Libya. That's a lie. The 60,000 sorties that Joanne talked about, that's not one plane flying there and dropping one bomb. These are these are waves of bombers going in there. There were more bombs dropped in Libya than all of World War II combined. They, they used... Uh... And they used, bombs. yeah, they used, they used multiple warhead bombs, cluster bombs, again, outlawed by all we international have, We have photos and videos. They used the poor man's nuclear weapon, which is a fuel air explosive. It's a two-part bomb. The outside layer, when it blows up, is, is munition, 
uh, weaponized phosphor, little tiny particles, and it disperses over a large area. The second explosion ignites all that phosphor. It burns at 6,000 degrees, increases atmospheric pressure 20 times, eliminates all the oxygen, and everything below it is absolutely eliminated. Every man, woman, child, cockroach, and everything. And uh, those were deployed in Seert, in, in Bani Walid, all over Libya. Those are weapons of mass destruction that have been outlawed by the, uh, and the yeah, Geneva. For everybody. 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 And the United States was the maker of those weapons. And the pilots that dropped those bombs were U.S. pilots. So this is something that this is a war crime at, at proportions that nobody could grasp. Well, nobody ever talks about it because all the media except shows like yours, Bill, are owned by the Soros group and that bunch. So all the mainstream media, same guys that destroyed Libya, own all the media outlets. So the stories that are told are only the stories that they want told or how they're told. They write history to meet their agenda. They don't write the truth. And so when when we were seeing these things with our own eyes and trying to tell people about them, and I'll get back to the rockets because that was the reason for the untimely demise of Chris Stevens, is if you remember Bill Clinton, uh, pardon Mark Rich, that was one of his last acts as president. And Mark Rich was a was a money uh, launderer, gun trader, and everything. A really bad guy. Lives still lives in Switzerland. Well, part of his conditions for pardoning is Clinton wanted to become his partner in the arms business because uh, the military industrial complex sells their weapons through blinds and third parties and stuff, and everybody marks it up 10 times. So uh, Clinton uh, became a partner in the gun running business immediately when he left president. They arm both sides of the war. Of yeah, the war. all the bankers, all wars are banker wars, and they arm both sides. Because in wars, expensive things are blown up, and they have to turn around and buy them again. So, you know, fomenting wars is, is good business for them. But these rockets that we were told about by the Libyans, there were 20,000 shouldered air rockets moved into Libya in April. This is after the uh, no-fly zone had been fully established. Why would you move shouldered air rockets when there were no planes in the air? As the U.S. pilots that set that up said, after two and a half days, they, they had completely succeeded in establishing no-fly zone. They said the Libyans couldn't get a mosquito in the air. So here are these 20,000 rockets in there. And then these rockets were such a danger to the world that the world leaders or the country leaders around Libya started complaining to the UN and NATO. And they said, look, there's a, a sieve, there's weaponry coming out of, of Libya coming through our borders and being dis- distributed all over the world, this is a danger to our country. So not only are you screwing with Libya, but you're now uh, threatening our country. That was Chad and Niger and all these countries that are contiguous to Libya. So in the infamous meeting, the night that, that Chris Stevens was killed, he was having dinner with the ambassador from Turkey. And he was pleading with this Turkish ambassador to use the... Erdogan, who is the leader of, of Turkey, thinks he's going to be the caliph when a uh, Muslim caliphate controls the world. Uh, Chris Stevens says, we've got to have these rockets back, and we will pay whatever amount uh, needed to get them back because we it's going to cause it's causing us so much international repercussions that we've got to have them back. And the Turkish ambassador told him for all practical purposes to pound sand. He then left that, that house, which was never... Uh, it was never a an official facility. It was a safe house in Benghazi. And he left, went by fast car to the airport and taken back to Turkey. And the attack on that, on that facility started when he landed back in Turkey. Now, how do we know this? Because the man that was serving dinner at that home that night was a Sudanese. He was actually an attorney, very well read, but they didn't know he spoke English. He was one of the spies for the tribes of Libya. And he was in there serving meals, and he heard everything that took place. That information should have been wanted, at least, by Trey Gowdy and Louis Gohmert, all these guys in the United States that were claiming to be investigated about what happened in in Benghazi. They didn't want to know that. Well, 
you know, the 20,000 number, we had like Claire Lopez, who is, uh, she says she's no longer CIA. Now, nah, she's absolutely still 100% so the Citizens CIA. Citizens Committee for Benghazi. Yeah, she was the one feeding the information to the Citizens Committee on Benghazi about what happened. And we know for, from what she said. We spoke to her. Yeah, many times. And she was telling us about Benghazi and how did, how did we know about this house across the street and everything? Because you go here, you go left. She couldn't have known that information unless she had been there. So she had been to, to Benghazi. She had been to Libya. But anyhow, the 20,000 rockets, oh, there were 600. And those were, were really from Russia. They were in, in Libya storepile. No, they weren't. Now, the way this, the good Lord validates this stuff to us, a few months ago, we got an email from a guy. He said he heard about us and he wanted our DVD. And he said, by the way, I work for the company that built those rockets. And he said, in April of 2011, a U.S. general, ranking general, called the five top executives, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed, Northrop uh, Grumman. Yeah, about these rockets. And he said, how did these rockets get into Libya he and then how did they get lost? He wanted to know about it. He said, this is unacceptable. And it turns out that there weren't 20,000 rockets. The U.S. Secretary of State's office, Hillary Clinton, bought and had delivered to her offices, if you would, 50,000 of these rockets in early 2010. Early 2010, 50,000. And the man told us, he said, these are not your average run-of-the-mill shoulder air rocket. They're the most sophisticated uh, shoulder air rockets made. We could take a 12-year-old. And in a couple of hours, give him uh, enough training that he could hit a long range target within a foot. So he said, these will knock down planes everywhere. Well, you take 50,000. Now you're talking about able the ability to knock down every plane in the world. So, you know, the question Joanne always asks, what in the hell is the U.S. Secretary of State's office doing buying those kinds of weapons, hitting them under, under the table and then distributing them. I what, think these are about a million, a hundred thousand yeah, dollars each. What, what authority does the State Department have to buy weapons like that? And what, what kind of money we're talking about if you if they're each a million and a half and they ordered fifty thousand? And and why was Hillary Clinton ordering them or authorizing it? And what where did they go? And that kind of thing. It, it, and that's gotta be the tip of the iceberg. You know, it just didn't happen one time, I'm sure. And, in fact, one of these rockets they later shot down a U.S. helicopter. Yeah, and that's what started the whole thing. That's what started the whole thing, how they started to unravel this. And they said 30,000 of those rockets did not go to Libya. They don't even know where those 30,000 rockets are, the thirty, the other 30 of the of the 50 that were sold so to the State then, Department. So now we've been told since then, well, you all are just naive. You know, the Secretary of State's office, the Department of State, uh, the CIA operates with them, and that's how they get all these weapons and all this money. Yeah, but the State Department is run by the CIA, yeah. according to the, some of the people we've been. Now, then, the way they distribute money in here, again, we have proof of that. The guy that was installed in Egypt as the leader, when they, when they, Morsi, he was a 30-year friend of the Clintons. He and his wife were both lifelong friends, and he was absolutely 100% Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, the people. Which in, is an Islamic radical terrorist group and has been designated by many countries. I and Obama's a Muslim Brotherhood guy. So when the people of Egypt hadn't had had enough, they rioted in the streets and they went through his government over and they went into his offices and in his private safe, they found all kinds of documents, including one document from the U.S. Secretary of State's office where it had the names, the amount, the date and the signature of all these Muslim Brotherhood executives that receive payments from the Secretary of State's cash, office, cash, cash payments. payments in Cairo, and the amounts were $855,000 down to $250,000 each. These 17 men were later uh, tried as spies for the United States. Uh, in either, Egypt. Yeah, in, in Egypt. Egypt. Either five or seven of them were sentenced to death. The rest of them life in prison without parole. This was after uh, General Sisi took over control. Yeah. Now, that family. document in itself is enough to prove that the, that the operations of the, of the State Department of the United States ought to be shut down worldwide because the rest of the countries should be fearful. If it happened in Egypt, where it was a friendly country in the United States, it's happening every place. 
the next another document was found in there is there was a a payment by Obama to Morsi for eight billion eight billion dollars to buy half the Sinai Peninsula so the Muslim Brotherhood would have a home country. After the general was installed, after Morsi was thrown out, locked up, after he was installed, one of the first calls came to him from Obama, where Obama said he wanted he demanded the money back. And he demanded all documentation. All the documentation. The and the general said, no, we're going to handle this investigation ourselves. So that is there. Nobody's ever asked about that. That's never been brought up in the media over here. So you see, the, the control of the media is the way that you keep the, the people, the sheeple, if you would, barefoot and hungry. Uh, also, Bill, one more thing I'd like to add about Benghazi is that Morsi was the man who uh, funded, armed, trained the people that killed Chris Stevens. And we know that because we have the security document from Libyan security that was given to the tribes and then given to us and actually published by Jerry Corsi uh, for World Came Net from Daily. Us to him. Came from us to him. And then it was read into the congressional record. States in there that it was Morsi who was behind the attack on Benghazi. And now, if that's true, uh, which I assume it is because that was an official investigation, then you have to point at Hillary Clinton. And, and of course, Chris Stevens was assassinated. It wasn't any attack. The attack was the smoke smoke screen um, because Chris Stevens knew way too much about the gun running. He was their gun runner in Libya from the very beginning before the uh, revolution started. Before he was ambassador. Before he was, yeah, he was CIA yeah. before he was ambassador. And. And he knew too much. You know, people around the Clintons tend to die uh, if they know too much. He, you know, dead men tell no tales. So it was an absolute assassination. And the the cover up is is extensive. But it, we know the truth. The but tribes, you know, the tribes this, have told us this proof positive. Nobody in Washington D.C. wanted to confront this information. Nobody wanted to, to know the truth. Trey Gowdy, big firebrand very well-spoken attorney, you know, all that stuff. His two biggest money gatherers heard us at a John Birch. We used to do seminars for the John Birch Society, and they heard us, and they said, oh, wow, your story is, you know, really impressive. And Trey Gowdy is, is we're close to him. We're his biggest money gatherers, and he's going to want to know all this information. And uh, we're going to contact him. He'll be in touch with you right away. We can guarantee that. Well, a couple of days later, they called us back. Well, how'd your talk go with Trey Gowdy? Never heard from him. Oh, well, we don't understand that. We'll get back to you. So a few days later, they call back. Have you heard from Trey Gowdy's office? No. Well, here's his number. Please give him a call. You know, he's a busy guy. We called his office. His secretary told Joanne and said, yeah, we know who you are. We've got your number and everything. We have a file on you. She yeah. said, if we need you, we will contact you. Never heard from him. <laughs> really think about it. They, this is a deep, deep hole. If they start to unravel the weapons that went to the State Department under Obama, under Clinton and stuff, they're going to go down that hole. They're going to go back to the Bush administration. They're going to go. De There's all kinds of things that have been going on for a long time. Nobody wants that uncovered. So they continue to cover up the entire thing. I, I just I just wanted to say that the first time I became aware of the Moriarty's, they were on John B. Wells show. And the story was so incredible that John B. Wells did not interrupt them as I'm trying not to right now. I listened to about 15 minutes of the show and I hunted down Jimmy and Joanne and I got an email to them requesting them to come on my first show last year. The funny thing is I finished listening to what they had to say. And I said to myself, do I really want to be in touch with these people? And there was a time when Jimmy warned me that bill, what we say and what we do is, you know, common knowledge to the evil empire. And I replied to him, you know, Jimmy, I've been trying to get my name on that list for years, and I know my name is on that list because you don't know what I've been involved with in the past. And as of late, I've been telling people, yeah, I'm a whistleblower myself, and if there are certain things I let out, they're going to nuke me and blame it on North Korea. So uh, Jimmy and Joanne, we're in the same boat here. And uh, to be honest with you, I know for a fact that they don't want us dead because if they kill us, we as spirits will come back at them and it is a spiritual battle. So they are keeping us trapped in our bodies and we're doing the best we can to get this truth out that this is the most important 
show I have ever done. And I have to thank John B. Wells, who was a guest on my show, for putting me in touch with Jimmy and Joanne Moriarty. And to be honest with you, we are the best of friends on this planet. And if they do away with us, we're coming back and they will be afraid of us. So I'm sitting here with muted because I am just laughing, crying, and just distraught over the facts of what the great Satan under the name of the United States is doing to the rest of the world. So I'm going to just mute my microphone right now and calm down. I love you people. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing that happened to us, we were like, as I said, we were business people and Joanne is, is really, if anything, she's an introverted person. She doesn't like me in the spotlight at all. And, uh, you know, she's really a, a great humanitarian in her own right. We, we had, uh, a nonprofit. We did humanitarian activities funded completely by, our, by ourselves forever. We always participated our profits back with needy people and things like that. And we didn't ask for any recognition about that. We stayed out of the political limelight because these political things were really kind of a nasty piece of the, of any country. And we didn't want to be a part of it to that. So we were cleaning up the environment where we do uh, environmental remediation. We clean up diesel spills and oil spills and, and pipeline pipelines. spills. And so we really do a good service to the planet. And we're happy with that. And we're legitimate. We never paid boxes or bribes or more detail to anybody. We always let the let the people understand that, you know, our product is good enough to stand on its own. All that yada yada yada. But the truth is when you see things like this and Joanne and I were we were knocked back like you and other people were we we were seeing these things and it was so abhorrent and the poor people were suffering at no for no good reason no good reason and uh, we talked about it we said you know if we don't expose this then our silence is is yeah you know, is complicit with the bad guys and we can't do that we do not under any circumstances want to be associated with these guys so we First of all, start trying to tell the U.S. government people how wrong-footed they were in when Libya. We back. And uh, Joanne, her dialing finger is one digit shorter than it used to be from from calling everybody in Washington D.C. People in the state government in Texas called and called and called and this called. Was, this was in, right after we got back in 2011 yeah. in September, and and continued on as long as I until 2012 when we finally made contact. Uh, well, I made contact, but nobody ever responded. Finally, Tara Dahl, who was uh, the assistant to Michelle Bachman, uh, called us and said that she was interested. Michelle Bachman wanted to know what information we had about Libya and the facts that we had. And we started talking to Tara Dahl when she realized that the last days in Tripoli, when, when NATO invaded Tripoli, Tripoli was a stronghold of the Libyan people. Like you said, Bill, there were millions of people that took to Green Square with the with their green flag supporting their government, and uh, that was never reported by anybody. But the Libyan tribes had written a new constitution um, that we were sitting with Sheikh Ali, the leader of all the tribes in the Mahari Hotel, three days before NATO invaded Tripoli, when that constitution was delivered to him, and he tapped it with his finger and said, "This is our new constitution." And they had done that because they felt that that would stop the NATO attack on them. That NATO had demanded they have a constitution. They were democracy and all this other stuff. And uh, the tribes are a pure democracy, by the way. Anyway, three days later, NATO invaded uh, Tripoli because they couldn't have that constitution. They didn't want a constitution originated by the Libyans. They want a constitution originated by the Zionists that turned yeah. over title of that country to the Zionists. Yeah. So at that time, when all these, uh, when they bombed Tripoli, they brought their black helicopters in and just mowed people down in the streets. Uh, 1,300 people ki killed the first hour. 5,000 were wounded. And then they just brought, they just started bombing and they brought in all their ships with all these little trucks with the, with the Al Qaeda on the trucks. Well, we were captured by Al Qaeda at that time and eventually got out of Al Qaeda's hands by the help of three miracles. One of, one of them was which, uh, was an Al Qaeda guy who knew us when we were trapped in, in the Mahari Hotel being held by Al Qaeda. He came from the hotel and he said, I know you people, you're good people. He said, I may not agree with your politics, but at the same time, you were just trying to help Libya. And he said, if you if you take this van to the rescue ship, which had been sent by Malta over to pick up dignitaries and the Russian ambassador who knew us had put our name on that ship. We had, uh, what, four or five other people with us. 
He said, if you go to that ship, they've set up a kill zone for you. Two blocks away from this hotel, they're going to kill you, burn you and chop you up and blame it on Gaddafi. So he said, this van is going to take you the other way. You're not going to the rescue ship. And, and eventually we got out through the help of some other people. But it was a miracle at that point. And when we got home, which was the first part of September, we started immediately calling all these people. Well, Michelle Bachman's aide said to me, she said, you need to be in touch with the, either the FBI or somebody because they need to understand you were held by Al Qaeda. Uh, people who are captured by Al Qaeda usually never survive. And if you were, you need to be debriefed. So she put us in touch with a young man who was uh, attached to the FBI terrorist task force. He was, task, a, he was task a detective force. from Oakland. Yeah, he was a police and for detective. For 10 years, he had been uh, on loan to the uh, FBI. Terrorist task force. Terrorist task force. Very nice guy. He called me, and, and I sent him some of the photos I had, some the information I had. I told him what happened to us. He said, this is really incredible. He said, you, I can't believe they didn't debrief you when you came into the airport and take you when you came to the airport. I said, well, they didn't know we were captured by al-Qaeda. They were, the U.S. military was not helping anybody. The I NATO was, was not helping anybody. I was interviewed or interrogated for three hours when we got yeah, back. The F- they let Joanne go through yeah. three different screens. One guy, one human, and three screens, and and so three different entities were feeding him questions that he asked me. That went on for three hours. That was at the Houston George Bush Airport. Yeah. He was taken there when we were going through passports. And their and questions were mainly, "How did you get to Libya? Who paid for your for your trip? Why were you what there? were you doing there?" They kept asking that over and over and over again. Well, well, we had we had our own money. We had our own resources. We paid for everything ourselves. So, you know, I guess they were trying to trap us as, as uh, spies or spies something. or something, but they couldn't get there. So when, when he finally turned me loose, he said, uh, we'll be, uh, you know, we will be contacting again. Okay. We never heard from them again. But uh, when Tim, uh, the guy in, in uh, California spoke to me, he said, I'm going to call the DIA. Give his name. Tim Hunt is his name. When, when um, he said, I'm going to contact the DIA the Defense Intelligence Agency, because they're the head of all intelligence agencies and they need to come in and debrief you. I said, well, that's fine. I have no problem with that. He said, they'll be in contact. Probably take them a few weeks. We heard from them within a day and they were in our house and three three days later, their agent was there. His name was Eric Maddox and he debriefed us, but that's not the name he gave us. He gave us the name of Kevin Davis. His real name is Eric Maddox. He, de- he debriefed us. He was in our house a number of times and eventually... We stopped that contact because we were we fed him uh, actionable raw intelligence on the ground via the Libyan tribes that we could get any time we wanted, where Al Qaeda was, where their weapons were. The tribes were feeding us all the time because they thought if we talked to the good people in the United States, they would come over and help cleanse this mess that they brought into Libya. Now, when Joanne's saying we're giving them actionable intelligence, we were giving them pinpoint latitude and longitude locations of where the Al Qaeda leaders spent the night where their underground bunkers were, where their weapons were stored. How they brought them in. How, how they brought them, them in. Point in detail. I mean, absolutely actual intelligence. And we've learned since then that was raw intelligence. It didn't belong to anybody but Joanne and Jimmy. And that uh, we did not work for any government. We didn't work for any intelligence agency. It was data that we could do whatever we wanted with it. We'd sign nothing with anybody. So And so, you know, that, was, that puts us in a really unique position. We didn't know the value of that raw intel status until much later. But the the truth is, is that all the information we get to this day is still raw data. And the reason they haven't killed us is because the only way they have contact with to know what the tribes are doing is, is through us. The truth is, is that all the information we get to this day is still raw data. Oh yeah. We had, they gave us the Libyans gave us one time. They said the CIA has set up this huge training center where they're bringing people from all over the world into this new training camp. They're being trained in these subversive activities. And armed. And armed, trained, and financed and everything. And it's this huge area in Derna, near Derna, which Derna is far northeast Libya. And they gave us the exact location, how many people were there, et cetera. They they would pull up Google Maps and give us the pinpoint. And this camp, brand new, fully funded and everything, three days later, the, the After we gave them the intelligence. Yeah, and it went up to the top offices in the United States. Three days later, that camp is being dispersed, and it was an emergency uh, disbursement, and they told everybody, get rid of you know, weapons. get rid of all the weapons except what you can take with you. And so the, these 10,000 trainees that were there, 
uh, or 10,000 operatives training, I don't know how many others, immediately were, were dispersed. They went across the desert into Algeria, we know, because one of the Libyan operatives, one of the military operatives was with them and called from the desert. He kept them, giving us... Pinpoint where they stopped, where they were going, you know, we're when here, they crossed we're here, this we're border, here, we're here. where they went. But, then, that kind of intelligence, uh, we were told by... Pete Sessions, who was a congressman from Dallas, we confronted him way back there, and uh, he validated who we were and who our contacts were, and then he said, well, I'm going to get to the bottom of this and find out why the intelligence agencies have made you your best, their best friends. And so he went to General Flynn, who was then head of the De- Defense Intelligence Agency, as Joanne said, top rung of intelligence agencies in the United States, called him into his office. Pete reiterated all this stuff to us by phone. And he said, when General Flynn came into my office, he wasn't happy coming into my office. Flynn said, you know, people come to my office. I don't go to theirs. But Pete is a ranking congressman, head of the rules committee. So he came in there and and, uh, Pete laid out the details we we told him. And uh, that first meeting with Pete was an hour and a half. And he hand wrote pages worth of information we gave him. He asked Flynn about all this stuff, and General Flynn said that all their information. He said, is, I, "I know the Moriarty." He said, "All their information is one hundred percent accurate." He said, "They have never provided anything that is not one hundred percent correct." And he said, "The the my, amazing thing is, they've somehow gotten inside the tribes, got the confidence of the tribes, and no intelligence agency from any country has ever been able to get into the tribes of anywhere." Any country. And he also confirmed that we had been soft killed and blacklisted and destroyed, et cetera. And Pete asked him, he says, why haven't you made these guys your best friends? Well, the reason is we're not we're not under contract with them. They don't control us. He, he didn't us. give that reason. He didn't give that. He said he why. didn't have an answer for that. But he did say it's amazing to them that two people could sit in the Woodlands, Texas, where we were, and pick up a phone any time, day or night, and get actionable intelligence on the ground in North Africa. He said that is that is just shocking to us. But the thing about like Benghazi, for example, when Benghazi happened, when Chris Stevens was killed, the night it was happening, the tribes gave an emergency call to us and they said, you need to tell your people immediately. And we had no one to contact. That's the sad part. Tell your people immediately that the men who did this, who killed your ambassador are in this hospital hiding out in Benghazi right now. They can get them there. This is where they are. And they told us how many men were there, where they were, and how they were. Three hours later, they called back and they said, okay, you missed that one. But these guys have shaved off their beards, have changed their clothes into Western clothes, and are in these cars, these the SUVs or whatever they are, they told us, and heading towards Cairo, Egypt. They're Which cross, is a long cross, road. Across the border. And they said, you'll find them on that road. It's a long road, 900 kilometers. I don't know how far it is to Cairo. But he said, you'll find them on that road. They can find them. He said, they These three right SUVs, tracking. and they gave us the color and description of the three SUVs. So we had instant <laughs> intelligence when that was taking place. Yeah, We've also learned since then that there were weaponized drones above that location in Benghazi before it ever happened, during and after. So they could have stopped that attack, the U.S. military could have stopped that attack anytime they wanted to, but they were ordered not to. So, you know, the stinky, stinky mess that is Benghazi, well, as Joanne said forever, yes, Joanne said forever, that's, that's Hillary Clinton's Achilles heel, and that will cause her undoing. We pray Libya it still will does. Libya cause her undoing. Yeah. Libya, Libya is her big, biggest Achilles heel. But, you know, the Libya was blown up because of the African bank. That's the truth. There were two other conciliary reasons, if you would. One was... The U.S. military has set up these continental control units all over. And AFRICOM was to be the military, U.S. military control of Africa and all its national natural resources. They wanted to keep those resources away from China because they plan one day to have a big war with China. That's the U.S. military. Libya and six other countries in Africa refused to join AFRICOM. And when Libya was blown up, the first thing that happened, the phony government that was installed by the U.N. immediately turned over the military control of Libya to AFRICOM. And thereafter, within days, the other six countries did also. So so the consolidation of military control over Africa was accomplished by the blowing up of Libya. The third thing was... Uh, all the, the countries that had invaded Africa, uh, France, England, Italy, 
Greece, Turkey, Germany, all of them that had gone into Africa and taken over countries had made treaties with locals. And of course, none of those treaties were ever complied with. The, the net result was, is they just really took control of those countries and they stopped blowing those countries up it's by treaty and then, and then never honored the treaties which benefited the people of those countries. So all these countries, after the African Union was formed, and incidentally, Gaddafi was a big uh, focus point in the establishment of the African Union. And, and he was the first president of the African Union. Yeah, and he did so much first world activity. So, so the African Union had gotten together, and these countries had all brought forward a class action suit led by Gaddafi against all these imperialist countries for the treaties that they broke in Africa. And they put a dollar figure on it, and it was in excess of $7 trillion. And that case was brought before international court prior to 2011. And as the attorney said, that lawsuit had legs because there were clear violations of all the treaties by all the, the offending countries. Now, the truth was, is that England and Germany and Italy and France and all these had no money. They could not afford to make those kinds of payments. That's how the European countries... That's why Gaddafi was such a target. Yeah, that's how they got behind the destruction of Libya, because then that lawsuit would go away. And so there were really those three reasons, but the primary reason was the gold back currency for Africa. But they used second Libya. Africa and then third was the was the lawsuit. They used Libyan money to blow Libya. Up. Yeah. Now then Libya had under the treaty of two thousand and seven, Libya had to move its money into the Federal Reserve System and into Euroclear. And it did. It had it, at the time Libya was was blown up, there was two hundred and forty one billion dollars in within the Federal Reserve System in dollar and dollar equivalents. There was a hundred and fifty billion euros in the European Central Bank. Uh, Libya also had 179 tons of gold. They had uh, 2,000 tons of silver. They had many, many, many tons of all the rare earths and heavy earths. There was about 39 billion in cash inside the country. And John McCain knew. And John McCain knew all of that. John McCain, in the treaty of 2009, he went in there and told the Libyans, well, you sign this treaty and the United States is going to do all these things, what can we do for you? And they took him in a heavily guarded vehicle, drove him way out into the desert, took him into the underground bunkers where all this all this gold and this and this wealth was shown to him, and they told him, We don't need anything from you. So uh, you know, he that he is a Zionist, he is a bad guy, he's a traitor. He was, he was, after, that. He was after that gold, he was over there in Libya at the beginning. <sighs> of the false flag yeah. revolution. And he was back a number of times. He was, he had joined hands with uh, Abdul Hakim Belhaj, who was the leader of the Libyan Islamic fighting group, a radical group started by him. And he was thrown out of Libya. He was actually arrested by the CIA and MI5 and imprisoned, eventually sent back to Libya where he was in prison. Uh, but he was, he was the head of that group and he became John McCain's best friend. Uh, when he was released from prison, became one of the leaders of the radicals when they were taking over Libya, when NATO was doing it. And, and since the Zionist bankers took all this money that belonged to the Libyan people and took control of it in the first week of their revolution, first time in history that a bunch of rebels that nobody knows establishes a central bank in Benghazi and they're given title to all this Libyan money. They didn't get the money. The Zionists kept it, but they did provide a billion dollars went to them that was funneled through Saudi Arabia into Libya. Of course, the bankers took out their fee and they took out about uh, seventy one million dollars in fees to get that money into Libya. But that left them money to pay every mercenary twenty five hundred dollars to sign up, then twenty five hundred dollars uh, for every soldier they killed. And then another thousand dollars if they uh, chopped up and burned the body. Uh, they're paid uh, $2,500 a month also to continue fighting. This money was used to entice politicians to come into Libya. And every time a foreign politician would set foot in Libya and uh, support, uh, support the rebels, they were given a gift of $10 million. John McCain was there at least three times. Hillary Clinton was there. All these politicians from all over 
Sarkozy from France, uh, the guy from Italy, all these guys via Benghazi went in there, and they they went home with a with a uh, uh, satchel of, of chest full of money. A million dollars is a cubic foot, so ten million dollars is a pretty good sized bundle. And uh, this money was just like like a, a box of cookies that was passed out to all these politicians. But the five hundred billion dollars that was taken from Lib- from the people of Libya was used to pay NATO. Yeah, it was. The, you know how how beautiful a situation is that for the bad guys? They use Libya's money to blow it blow it up. And keep it destroyed. Yeah, keep it destroyed. And it's and Libya is still a failed state. It's still in terrible shape. They continue to send in mercenaries and money every day. And, uh, you know, they continue. They've gone in with a phony government. They had an election. The the UN organized an election in Libya in 2014. Yeah, 2014. People of Libya voted. And, of course, Bel Hajj and all the bad guys didn't get any votes. They got so, all the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, all of them got thrown out of office and there was to be a new government installed. There were some sprinklings of rats, as they call them, or traitors in that government, but mostly it was run by people who wanted Libya back to, to Libya. That government, after the election, the bad bad guys, the government that... The U.S. Had, sponsored yeah, mercenary. The, the U.S. puppet government that was there refused to recognize that election and began to attack those that were elected, blew up their houses... Uh, kidnapped their kids, shot their wives. So Raped they, their, their girls. They had to pick up and move everything, their government, to Tobruk, which was on the far other side of Libya in the east. Right on the Egyptian border. And set up their government there because they were going to be killed otherwise. That and Meanwhile, that phony government that was never elected, never supported, n- Libya never wanted, continued in Tripoli trying to act like they were the government. And every member of that phony government all the officials and everybody all of a sudden have bank accounts in Germany and other places with $100 million in it. Yeah. And, of course, Libyan money. Eventually, the UN, uh, which had a German person representing Libya. I mean, this is to Libya, this is a great shame to have some other country representing them at the UN. They hate that. They, they don't even like the UN. They don't want to be part of the UN because the UN lied and attacked them and would not even follow their own ground rules to send fact-finding commissions in before they blew up the country. But on top of that, they started in Tunisia. They put together a U.N. puppet government put together by the U.N. The Libyan people and the Libyan uh, tribes said, we don't recognize this government. We don't want this government. This was in 2015. Don't even bring it here. And so they had to sneak it in by the dark of night by boat into Tripoli, put it under the care of Bel Hajj in the airport he was controlling with his, his weapons and his people and had a prison there, put him in there until they finally could sneak him out. And then... The U.N. immediately recognized as the prime minister of Libya their their puppet that they put in, that they snuck into Libya and Tripoli and put him all around the world, even sent him to meet Trump. Not the U.N. sponsored election. Not the U.N. sponsored election. This is a a government appointed by the U.N. in Tunisia. They couldn't accept the election results. So they, they put in this phony government immediately recognize it. Now, this government had a mandate of 18 months. As it has run out. This was in 2015. They still act like they're the acting government. They are not. The Tobruk government runs out at the end of this month. So there will be a new election in Libya in 2018. Yeah. That is the hope of the Libyan people, uh, to throw all of these people out of their country. But, you know, it's it's amazing Whenever you get this information like we get and you try to explain to people here in the United States, here's what's going on. And the people look at you like you're cross-eyed. You know, how could that be the U.N.? Why, they're good people, you know, NATO. No, not at all. This is this is absolutely the the, the cabal owns the United Nations. The, The arguments I get mostly is are people that have read the mainstream media. And they say, well, that's not true because that didn't happen in Libya. This, this, I just read this here. And I said, well, I get my information directly from the great tribes of Libya. And if you can dispute that, then do it. The, uh, tribe, ABC, the tribes never give us any information that they haven't verified three times at least. Like we'll hear something from, from somebody that say on the ground in Libya and we will call them or Joanne does all the communication. They don't understand my Texan. But Joanne calls them and says, what about this? We'll have to check that. We'll have to verify it. We think it's correct. And then, you know, uh, hours or a day or so later, they come back. Yes, this is completely correct. This part of it's correct. This is not. And and we know that they do that because General Flynn has confirmed that everything we get from them is 100 percent accurate. And speaking speaking of accurate, one of my friends on Facebook put up the video of the slave market in Libya 
and I sent that link to Joanne. And Joanne, basically, the CNN report is just another method of having us want to destroy Libya even more. I mean, we know that it, it's not good there. They're blowing it up to a proportion where we got to go back in there and straighten it out again. Is that correct, Joanne? No, there's no, no slave trade. No, no, there's no slave trade going on in Libya. If there is, it's being done under the dark of night by the bad guys who are there. The Libyans have absolutely told me 100% there is no slave trading going on in Libya. The lady reporter who says she was in a house where they were doing slave trading, none of that's even possible in Libya. If, if a, there's no, First of all, there's no reporters in Libya. They're banned. You have no news media in Libya at all, except some internal Libyan news media. That's it. No foreign news media is allowed in period. Libya, period. Secondly, no woman would be allowed into a house where they were slave trading. Yeah. I doubt any, any man would even be allowed in there, but certainly no woman because the, the ones who are controlling the country now are, are anti-women. They don't want women in that country, even outside, without a complete face cover. So the, the part of Libya where the bad guys are controlling it is really the Tripoli area, not the Tobruk area. What Joanne's talking about, the people in control are the mercenaries of the U.S., U.N., CIA, Mossad, et cetera. And they are mainly concentrated in the Tripoli area, but with factions around. Ms. Rata is, the, yeah. is a and big Ms. Rata. rat faction. And, but the majority of Libya... Uh, is is, is legit, legitimate the Libya. Let's say legitimate Libya. The the illegitimate control of Libya is if the, their it, last stronghold is Tripoli. Yeah. And if there was any slave trading taking place, it'd be done there by the U.S. UN NATO phony government. And even at that, Who's the tribes fight? that have spies and all those things said there's no there's no slave trading going on here. First of all. The Libyan money has, de has been devalued to the point, and now it used to be like one one dinar and a quarter for the U.S. dollars. Now eight to one. Uh, there is no money in Libya. A uh, chicken is six dollars. They don't have the money to buy it. There's no water. Electricity is sporadic. The generating facilities, water treatment Banks plants, only release been blown little up. bits of cash. People have to wait days in line to get a little bit of cash. But the Libyan tribes, the some of the general secretary of the tribes, some of the leaders have gone out to visit with the leaders of AFRICOM and they went to, um, they just took a trip to, not Ghana, but they just took a trip to a country in Africa and they released a full statement to yeah. Afri to the African Union that there are there is no slave trading going on in Libya, that this is a ruse, absolute ruse to try to get a reason to attack Libya again because the, the mercenaries, the puppets that are there, the control of the Western Zionists that are there are losing in Libya. The new election coming in 2018 is going to throw them all out. And this is, this is their latest ploy to cause a reason to attack Libya. And he said, the, the tribal leader said, you have to be very careful about putting this stuff out because there's so many people that are willing to grab onto this and want to believe that it's true. And in Libya, it is not true. And this is this is the general secretary to the tribes of Libya. It was put out in Africa. I have the I have the formal statement. I have a video of the guy saying it. And also, the ambassador to that country in Libya made that statement that this is not true happening in Libya. And the thing is, like here in the United States, the blacks have been have been indoctrinated to believe that uh, you know slavery. All the blacks are being enslaved. Listen, slavery has been happening time immemorial. And whites were slaves, blacks were slaves, browns were slaves. Who, whatever group took over another country made all those people their slaves. Libya was uh, invaded by and controlled by other countries for 8,000 years. 8, years. The first time they ever owned their own country was in 1969 when they had their bloodless coup, coup when the tribes took it back. And what Gaddafi did, and he was, he was a true Libyan at heart. He loved his country. He gave all the land to all the people who were working it as slaves for the Italians. He gave them the land. We know this is true, and we had a real interesting experience. During the first part of this false revolution, they were doing heinous acts like chopping people's heads off and blaming it on Gaddafi and blaming it on this and blaming it on that. There was a young man who had his head cut off, and they videotaped it live. What they did is they put it out all over the uh, TV in Libya and said, this is what... 
the the your, your Libyan government is doing to these rebels. The man was not a rebel. He was a Libyan soldier in the National Reserves or whatever, fighting for his country. And they had put on a, a street shirt on him and acted like he was a rebel. Well, nobody knew who this young man was. It was it was all over Libya. People were talking they about it. They showed it, you know, every hour. Uh, our driver in Libya was uh, our security guy, knew the family. They had, or they knew him. They contacted him and asked us if we would go interview them in a city called Rigolino. They were one of those two Americans. They, they, it was two and a half hours from Tripoli. And it was dangerous to drive because they were fighting everywhere. And he said they do not want to talk to CNN or anybody. The Libyan government was actually looking for these people to interview them. To the, debunk his lie. The CIA was CNN. The, the CIA was ABC. All of them were infiltrated over there. So we said, we're not media, but we'll go out and meet these people. And we did go out. We took a, a translator with us. We met these humble little people who lived out in a little house in Rigdaline. The little mother was there. She was about, these were, this was a black family. She was about five feet tall. And they sat and talked to us for two hours. At the end of this uh, interview, which I have on videotape, which is the most touching thing you can imagine. The, the translator asked her, she said, he said, is there anything you would like to tell these people that you would like the world to know uh, from the Libyan people? And she said something amazing. She said, yes, I would like them to tell the world that we thank God for Muammar Gaddafi. May he drink from the river of prosperity for all of his life. And we, the Libyan people, we stand in front of him and protect him because he gave us our life. He gave us our land. And, I mean, it was it's so touching. You can't even imagine. It still makes me tear up. Because this lady, nobody asked her to say that her son had been killed. And that, that one of the big points they made in this interview was that we, the Libyan people, if we have a problem in this country, if we have a problem with our leaders or with our people, we will take care of it. We don't need NATO. We don't need the UN. We don't need anybody here. We will take care of our own problems. And we know this is true. We part of this this information that Joanne was able to smuggle out on her personal hard drive. There were five. We we call them five interviews. That if they ever got in front of the, if we were ever able to show those to the people of the world, then we think that would cause a revolution against all the perpetrators of this of this attack on Libya. But there was another young man. We we call him Superman. We heard about him, and then we we tried to old. find him. He was seventeen years old. He was too young to fight. But he and some of his friends would take food and, and uh, uh, not any weapons or anything, not any ammunition, take food to, to okay. army, arm, army members that were fighting in areas that were near their the homes. Mountains. Yeah, and they did checkpoints on the roads. So uh, they had a little uh, Jeep-like vehicle. The four of them were in there, and they had a bunch of food they were taking up to some army guys. And the, the Jeep got hit, and it was by missile, and it was – blown over two of their guys were killed the other two were alive and uh, they trying to get away and they were caught his friend was killed this was a black guy they took him to their quote unquote camp and they poor tortured this poor young man you cannot believe what they did to him they they uh well, they shot him in the eye yeah but that was die. they were trying to kill him with yeah. that they they had castrated him cut open cut him open from all the way down his sternum all the way down his abdomen all the way down it they they stabbed his leg with a with a knife through one leg, left the knife in there. They this big open wound, they urinated on him in this open wound. Then when they, they were about to leave, they were gonna kill him, so they shot him uh through the eye. They were trying to kill him. We interviewed him in the hospital when they finally got home and his father was there. Her father was a general in the military, and his father was standing there and just had tears running down his eyes. I mean, it was the most his leg was horrendous paralyzed. thing. You can't even imagine. He said the people who captured him were not Libyan. They were not from Libya. He said he thought they had Afghani accents. So we know all these mercenaries were in there, all of them, whatever they are, contracted mercenaries or whatever, proxy army of the of the Zionists, of the New World Order criminals. And we tried to – we were so shaken by this young man, what he had gone through, that he that he was alive – was a miracle in the first place. And uh, Joanne and I told his father, we said, listen, you know, we will pay for your son to go anywhere in the world to get the treatment he needs to try to better his life. You know, he is, uh, you know, he, he has so he, many he survived so much. And uh, his father, great big mountain of a man, he looked at us and he said, we don't need anything from you. 
He said, all we need to, is for, for you, you to leave our, and your country to leave and us your alone. people to leave our country and leave us alone. We'll take care of ourselves. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it shakes me, and I've, I've heard your story many times. I, I did want to give you a chance right now that you have a, a CD out, and you had been living on the money from the CDs, and one of the dirty tricks they played on you was sending you pornography. But how can people get your CD and donate to you? Where where can they, et cetera? I will put the link in the video when I make a video of it, and I will also have it put in the chat room of the, the show as it's going on. Uh, how can people donate to you? They can go to our website, Bill. It's uh, LibyanWarTheTruth.com. And I'll say it again, Libyan War the Truth. That's one word, dot com. There's a donate button there that you can also buy our DVD there. And you can contact us if you want at AITrust at gmail.com. That's A-I-T-R-U-S-T at gmail.com. You can contact us anytime. You can contact us through our website. Our Skype name is Milo Smiles, M-Y-L-O-S-M-I-L-E-S. We're not, we don't turn Skype on except when we're going to do an interview like we're doing now. But, uh, you know, we, we encourage people to go to our website. Joanne publishes articles there all the time. I still been, get information from the tribes every day. Uh, right now, the big push is to get uh, Gaddafi's second son, Dr. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, is going to stand up, has announced that he will stand up and run for president of Libya in the new election in 2018. In that election, there will be a complete redoing of the House of Representatives. That will be all newly elected. There are other people, I guess, that are going to run for president, none that the Libyan people like. But Saif Gaddafi is highly educated, highly uh, – he's an engineer. He's an economist. He knows how the country ran very well. He understands that he was raised there. He's part of the tribal system, the the, uh, great tribes of Libya. Every member of Libya is a tribal member. The tribes of Libya back him as a leader because – he is their brother. They trust him. They know that he can stand and, and uh, help bring their all their people back together. When originally, in the Libyan government, and th- this is what's so criminal about them saying Libya had no democracy, Libya had, before 2011, Libya had an elected House of Representatives representing all the people in Libya. Then they had the second part, like we have the Senate and the House, the second part of theirs was the General Secretary of the Tribes, 200 member leaders of all the tribes of Libya, um, as the second house, and then they had a prime minister. So they had, the tribal structure is very uh, democratic, is what I'm trying to say. Um, They start, say, if you really had a problem in your tribe, you would go to like what you call a town hall meeting where all your tribes meet, you'd you'd express your problem and they'd try to solve it. If they couldn't solve it, it would go up another level and up another level. It would eventually get to the general secretariat. If they couldn't solve it, then it would go uh, to the prime minister or to anyone that they could feel would help them solve that problem. So people had a voice there. Well, in this new election, there, the general secretariat of the tribes will be put back as one of the houses and the House of Representatives will be elected and then they will elect a president. Before uh, Dr. Safe announced that he would run uh, for president, and this was just on the 17th of December this month, he announced it. There were only about 300,000 Libyans registered to vote because there was no interest in an election. They knew that these puppet governments were there and they were going to run their guy again. Well, when he announced it, in two weeks, there's now 1.68 million people registered. The tribes have also put out the ability for people, there's over a million still in exile, for those people to register in the countries they live in. So people are starting to register outside of Libya. This is a great thing for the Libyan people. They're very excited about this. The problem you're going to see now is the lies that are going to start to come out about uh, the ICC has charged against Dr. Safe for war crimes, which he never committed, not one war crime. They have no proof of this. They have no documentation of it. But they keep it there because they're trying to keep him from having any leadership in the country. You know, the the truth is, is that that, uh, Libya has, they failed even after killing a million. There were six and a half million Libyan people before U.S., U.N., NATO bombed them. They killed a million people. Can you imagine a million out of six and a half million were killed? I, I, one of the touching stories that, that you've told before, just to get a, a feel for the Libyan people, let's say you have the Hatfield and McCoys, and these are warring tribes. 
how did they settle that? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, this is such a touching story, and I'm just going to sit here and listen. As we've said, and it's true, the Libyans are the most non-confrontational people we've ever met in our lives. They don't want to fight about anything. So they're, the way the tribes settle their disputes, and this goes back to their culture a thousand years ago. If you run into my car and damage it, there's no insurance. I'm going, I'm going to forgive you for that, for that damage, but you're going to owe me a favor in return. And so sometime in the future, I'm going to call you and say, my daughter is getting married and you need to supply the food for the wedding. And you have to immediately agree to do that. And if you don't do it, then your family is obligated to do it. And if they won't do it, then your tribe is obligated to do yeah, it. Of course, you'll be honest with And that's the way it's settled. Now, if when you and I have that car wreck, if we can't come to that agreement, then they would put you and me in a jail cell together, and they would feed us uh, uh, substance kind of like gruel and, and uh, camel's milk, and we'd sit in that cell for as long as it took for you and me to come to the conclusion or the agreement that uh, you're going to owe me a favor and I'm going to forgive you. And that's the way it's done. And that happens from low level all the way up to the top. That's the way their resolution, it's, it's an agreed upon resolution to any kind of conflict. Now, there's a great story, Bill, that we were told by some people in Libya that that's a true story. I'm sure it could be confirmed. When uh, Gaddafi was appointed leader of the country in 1969, there were two uh, tribes and I don't remember exactly what area they were in, but they had been fighting for years, absolutely years. Uh, they wouldn't shop at each other's stores. They wouldn't do, they just, they just been like the Hatfields and McCoys, like you said. And <clears throat> the Libyan tribes and Gaddafi, they don't want, they didn't want this kind of thing going on in the country. So they came up with a solution. In the middle of the night, they went to all the people's homes of both tribes and took them in their pajamas out into the middle of the desert where they had set up a giant tent enough to hold all, both tribes. One had one side, one had the other with all the food and all the necessary items to survive and clothes and everything. And they told them, now you people are going to live in this tent and you'll be supplied food and everything, but you won't be coming out until you have agreed to get along with each other and live in peace and harmony. I don't know how long they stayed in that tent, but when they were released, these two tribes have been the closest of friends since that time. This is an ancient culture that Libya has and really, it's a jewel on the planet. This is this was my big concern when NATO was blowing it up that, that they were going to destroy this ancient culture that the Libyans passed down by word of mouth by their by their families by their tribes. It's just a beautiful culture. As to, as I've as I've said many times, it was the closest thing to virtual paradise on this planet. I mean, it it to say it breaks my heart and, and just I I am just so glad to have the opportunity to share your story and and I I don't care if this interview goes 6 hours, 12 hours, 18 hours, I will edit it into parts and cuz this one interview is is listening to you today is like all of the interviews <laughs> I've ever heard before and and I love you people. So you just keep talking and Jimmy <clears throat> If we get a chance, maybe on another show, uh, I want you to get into your uh, financial wisdom because you certainly could straighten a lot of people out when it comes to finances. And, and you have mentioned uh, slavery around the planet. And as we know, we are debt slaves. We are about as slaves as you can get in this world, living in this wonderful, beautiful country, which is the great Satan. <laughs> Well, that's the Babylonian debt scheme, but you know we'll get into that another time. But you know, let me let me get back to Libya, and I want to tell you how the uh, fly got in the ointment, if you would. About 150 years ago, the Khazarians, phony Jews out of Turkey, moved into the Misrata area of Libya, and Misrata is kind of almost halfway between the east and west uh, boundaries of Libya. And it had a it had a nice port area there, and so at 150 years ago, these criminals moved in there, and uh, they were they were they agreed to convert. To, yeah, they agreed to convert to Islam, and uh, so they had all the appearances of doing that and everything. But the truth was, they started a, a, a nonstop uh, campaign of subterfuge 
to take mafia. over Libya. They were mafia. And uh, they used all the mafia tactics. They threatened people. They, they harassed them. Uh, you know, they stole. did all they stole things. They did all these things. And the Libyan people being non-confrontational allowed them, if you would, to get away with this. And so uh, they let enough of the of the benefits of the natural resources of Libya flow to the people. So the people were, were improving their lifestyle and everything. But the majority, the bulk of the wealth was actually flowing to them. In 2007, 8, 9, 10, when we were there, we saw that a huge number of the contracts from Libya were flowing to these people. Now, we didn't know who they were. We had, had contracts for development yeah. infrastructure and stuff. And, and the unique thing about Libya, the government of Libya, was before the government signed any contract to do anything, the full amount of money for that contract had to be set aside in, a, in an account in the in central bank there. So any foreign contract was absolutely going to be guaranteed to be paid because the money was already there. And so uh, the the result was that the Zionists, the bad guys, the, the Turkish the mafia, mafia that had really taken over Misrata, and by 2007, the only uh, port, the only container port in all of Libya with this huge Mediterranean shoreline, the only container port was in Misrata, and it was a small container port. It could only handle a 100,000-ton ship and could only handle one ship a day. So, And they would not allow any more container ports to be built throughout Libya. So that meant all the major goods and services flowed through Misrata, which meant that, that they, of course, control that. They made profits from all that stuff. And uh, Mizrata was the only city in Libya that was laid out in a perfect grid. All the other ones kind of had random pathways where the houses were built around it. Straight line from Mizrata to the main highway that went east and west through Libya. When we would when we would drive around Tripoli, there was this real nice ten story building kind of out on its own. It was it was to the west of Tripoli. And I asked one of our drivers one time. I said, "What is that building?" They said, "Oh." That's Alibaba's building. And I said, Alibaba? He said, you know, Alibaba and the thieves. So the 40 thieves. So, the, you know, the Libyan people knew who that was. But as long as they didn't get interfered with, that was okay. That that group owned the largest oil field service company. That was the Turkish mafia. And that was, the, this is the Turkish mafia. The Mizrata people. The two brothers that were the main financial leg of that, one of them living in Houston, Texas, one of them living in London, those two criminals in 2010, or 9 or 10, sold the Libyan government $100 million worth of phony bonds, a Bernie Madoff kind of a scheme, and some young IT guys in in Libya that we met gave us this full details, and they said, we're exposing this, and the Libyan they're the government, they're the ones that found it, they said the Libyan government is finally going to get rid of these guys. They're going to confiscate all the things they've stolen and assets. get rid of. Coincidentally to that, the U.S., U.N., and NATO decided to blow up Libya. And, and the Turkish and, mafia joined hands with them. That today yeah. is Mizrata. That, that, was the, that was the group that joined hands with Obama and Clinton and to NATO. blow up Libya. That was the Mizrata mafia. And uh, those guys to this day are still the bad guys. There was, at one time, uh, the number was about 28,000 unmarked graves outside of the prison in Mizrata. There were so many dead bodies inside the prison. Well, they don't. It's not it, just a it prison. There. What they did is they took all empty buildings since the war and they made them into prisons. And they picked up uh, Libyan people, men, women, and children, and imprisoned them. If, if anybody who did not go along with the revolution, anybody they didn't like, anybody that looked sideways, anybody that had any money, anybody, it just didn't matter. They had, at one point in time, over 70,000 Libyans in prison. They had rape houses where they would go capture a bunch of women. and They, and they, argon, they harvested organs from mm -hmm. children, from young Libyans. They, they, every, and that was the Mossad in there doing it. That was Israel. They, the crimes they committed against humanity were so bad that the doctors without borders left Libya. Because they said, these tortured people are brought into us so we can make them survive a little longer. And then they just take them back and torture them again. We won't be part of it. So we see, we see that we've seen the same guy near death that we cure. He's sent back to him. 
A few months later, we see him again, and they finally, the doctor with that border said, we're not going to be a party to this, so they left. They've had all the, and Libya had absolutely the finest hospitals, the best equipped hospitals you've ever seen, and none of those hospitals were being used to treat the wounded soldiers, anybody. Well, after these parts of Libya were recaptured recently, they found that those cadaver vaults were full of young Libyans with organs missing. So those hospitals were being used as organ harvesting mills. mills for the Mossad and the Zionists. Children were disappearing like crazy. We went to one really sad, sad meeting where a bunch of parents had pictures of their children. They said, please help us find our children. Well, they had also orphan children who'd just been taken from the yeah. orphanages, and they, don't, they had no idea where these children went. They just disappeared out of Libya. And this gets back to the pedophilia. This gets back to the, the marketing of people. And you want to, you want to talk of, about slaves and marketing, we'll talk about that. I know that for a fact happened. Yeah. And they, the Zionists and the, the Satanists, they believe that drinking blood of, of babies uh, rejuvenates their, their being and gives them extra energy and everything. And, uh, you know, they're such, they're such evil, evil people. We found out just this last couple of weeks that their activities include sodomizing and, and killing these babies where they're so afraid that they produce all this adrenaline and then they kill them and then their blood is enriched with, with adrenaline, which further enhances the corpus of the Satanist. Now these things, you know, that, it's hard to, to talk about that, but it, it really, our mind's eye, if you would, has been so damaged that, you know, we, we'd like to take these images away forever. But we saw in Mizrata, if you would, families that were not Zionists, were not Satanists, they came home and found their children chopped up in their refrigerators. They also captured in Mizrata, they had a number of rape houses. And they captured a bunch of young girls, maybe 15, 14, 15, where they took them to these rape houses and raped them. And then they cut off their breasts and wrote nasty words in, in Arabic in the streets. Uh, this was such a horrendous crime that even the, the Libyan people couldn't even wrap their head around it. You know, and I, not the CIA, there was a, a reporter there from England. He was a freelance reporter. And he was talking to us one time and he said, you know, these horrendous things. I was told, he said, by a CIA operative, that these are trained missions, that they do these to, this to these people intentionally because that will kill the will of the people to resist and to fight. A father from Mizrata, two of his daughters, really pretty girls, or two of these that were, were captured, taken to a rape house, and their breasts were cut off. and They died. And they died. And he was, you know, how, how does a parent? He came up and talked at a tribal meeting we were at. And as he talked, the tears just ran down his face, and the people there were so shocked at what he was telling them. You know, the, the, the people were finally so angry, they didn't ha know what to do. And Libya was not an armed culture. No, no Libyans had any arms. So they were sitting ducks, literally, for, for these mercenaries to come in and do whatever they wanted to them. The Libyans were such a faithful people. Real sad. We tried to convince him to start a public relations campaign because the government of Libya was a burn card. The media were coming out was so bad. So many lies. And, so and many you know, they lies. weren't defending themselves. And they said, well, the truth in our God will save us. And we kept telling them, you know, we have to, we, you know, we have to try to help you understand that you've got this big gorilla putting out this negative propaganda about you all the time. And, and the truth Unless you get the people to know that, is not going to help. Well, they wouldn't do anything. They would not. We, Joanne and I, in the summer of 2011, we were their uh, foreign PR group. Without their uh, help or assistance or anything, you know, we were doing everything we could to try to get the truth out because we were shocked. That's as how we, we locked up with the tribes, yeah. actually. We, we, we decided the government was burn card, and the only legitimate uh, entity in Libya that could be promoted was the tribal structure and the general secretary because that was a legitimate democratic organization that included all the Libyans. So Joanne and I decided between the two of us that we would start going to all the tribal functions we could go to 
to try to promote the existence of a legitimate democratic entity inside Libya. And we went to all the tribal meetings and, and we were effective in that because here are these two little white faces. They always put us on the front row and we were seen in many, 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 we many tribal TV. organizations. We were, yeah, we we're on the biggest TV show in Libya. We were there. That show yeah. more than once. And we became known to the tribal leaders because they saw that we were really trying to help their country. They asked us, what business could we help you try to do because you're helping us? We said, until the blood stops flowing in the street in Libya, we will not be doing any business, period. But they understand. We sat with them during this time for 100 days while the blood flew, flow in the street. We, we just sat with them. We cried with them when their families were killed. We we helped, tried to help them in any way we could. Um, we we felt like it was happening to us. Believe me, we were there where the bombs were falling around us, all of us. Let me, let me, let me cut in here a second. Uh, as your story goes on, I, I usually make YouTube videos of my interviews. And as of late, YouTube has become a tool of censorship. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that I am going to have to edit this video so that I meet community guidelines. Uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind I'm sitting here shaking my head because I know one thing. This story will not get out on YouTube as thoroughly as it will on this radio show. And that that is a sin. And I just wanted you to know I'm going to do my best to get your story out wherever I can. And as I said, I, I will put up several videos and I'm sure one by one, I may get a community guideline strike or it's just not fitting for audiences. But the thing is, I have I have a main channel and I have five backup channels and I will lose all of them except for my main channel in order to get your story out. I, it just it, yeah, try Vimeo, too. That that as well. That as well. Uh, yeah. But uh, as for censorship in this country and YouTube. Oh, yeah, uh, it, it's it's breaking my heart that that is one platform, which is the platform. Anyway, I am going to try and I'm just going to leave it at that to do the best I can to get as much of this information out on the biggest platform on this planet it's, right now. We appreciate that. And we're, we're going to thank you on behalf of the living people. Joanne and I are the official spokespersons for the tribes of Libya. And that gives us some stature to present documents from them officially to government entities. Now, nobody's ever acted on them, but uh, way back there when, when Obama was still president, the Libyan tribes after put, Chris form, right after yeah, Chris was put former, forward a formal offer, and they said if the United States will just stop funding and supporting the mercenaries and radicals in our country, we will go out, uh, we'll the tribe will join together, we will cleanse Libya of all the radicals, and then we will go to every country in the world, join hands with the tribes in those countries and eliminate this these radical terrorists worldwide. That was the offer made by the Libyan tribes to Obama. Of course, he never even responded to that. Well, they yeah, reiterated that offer to Trump, not had him respond to that either. Well, I'm not sure Trump ever saw it. And then uh, Trump's emergency presidential order where he confiscated the assets of all the bad guys. That's hopefully to stop the flow of of money laundering and all the other stuff, which, of, of course, can have a benefit to, to Libya as well as the rest of the world. But these bad guys have, have been they have been in control for so long and they control all our history. We don't know the truth about what really has happened in our world in the last for sure three or four hundred years. These truths are coming out. And the things that happened in Libya for Joanne and myself were so horrendous. I, most people, I hope, never ever witness what we witnessed or go through what we went through. It changes you forever. And and when you're sitting with with the people that it when it's happening and the people you're with, it bonds you forever. I mean, you you can't ever turn your turn away from that. It it it's like when they meld steels together, you know, to make stainless steel. You can't separate those metals again. It's just we just came together with these people and became them, and they became us. And I got to say that that's exactly how I feel my bond with the two of you is uh, from the first time I talked to you. I, I knew there was a, a true bond here. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's, at some at some point, Jimmy, uh, 
You you were telling me about uh, Trump security uh, federating out the uh, people in the Secret Service trying to kill him, as well as the newspapers giving codes that it was time to kill Trump. Now, just today, I saw a Bible code, uh, Tippy, Tippy Canoe. In the Bible code, it mentions everything that's going on. And right down the center of this Bible code, it does say Trump is murdered. So I, I would just like you to clue the people into what you know about what's going on in his own secret service, as well as next week, I'm going to be interviewing Gary Byrne, who was the Secret Service agent outside the Oval Office for eight years while the Clintons were there. And I just found out he has a new book out. So I told him I have a new radio show and I would like to interview him. And I'm going to be interviewing him on Saturday. It's I have gotten myself into what I consider the board and I am fighting the board along with my fellow radio hosts. And as you said, we are the last bastion of truth. Thank you, Jimmy. Well, you know, the, the, the best source is not us for those for that information. There's a ex spy, Robert David Steele's his name he's there's a lot of videos available from him. There was a new one done by a Russian interviewer. What was it how do you pronounce it? Plesniak. Yeah. You know, he was the one that, that was disclosing how the counter coup against the bad guys was taking place during the election, he's there's a bunch of videos out from him. Those are really better sources from up uh, than we are. Have gleaned truths out of compiling all these different videos and looking at them. But I recommend that your audience go look up videos on him, listen to what he has to say, and then use your discernment about what he says. He's the one that that says the Secret Service that touch Trump's elbow every day. There are men in that group that are assassins trying to kill him, and they've been unsuccessful in doing it. Uh, since there was a 60-day period that McCabe, who's now given testimony, guaranteed to the intelligence agencies and, their, and these other criminal traitors worldwide that Trump would be taken out within 60 days. Well, that 60 days was up 1st December. And since then, there's been a bunch more attempts on his life. But the bad guys are losing this battle, and they are so desperate that they're now using uh, 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 sensationalism and false information and uh, subliminal messaging to try to find some crazy out there that will load a, a truck full of explosives and drive it into Mar-a-Lago and blow up Trump and his old family. Uh, they have failed. They've they failed in all their attempts because you've got to know that the Trump is under God's protection as well. And uh, they they have done all these things and they've been unsuccessful. So now they're so desperate. They're trying. There are these over 13 or 14,000 Marines that have volunteered to guard Trump in the White House. And that is the first time any Marine has volunteered to work in the White House since Obama was in there and uh, there were no Marines Marines that would ever volunteer to guard him. And so you got to know that the Marines are some of the messengers of God that they're trying to help him, trying to guard him. Before Trump ran for office, he was contacted by a bunch. We're going to call them the legitimate generals, not the, not the bureaucrats that Obama moved up in the military, you know, all the good generals and everybody resigned are forced to resign, but they came to Trump before he ran and they said, we will protect you. And they laid out the evil of the, of the deep state and said they would back Trump in all his efforts. And and they're around him. In addition to that, Trump hired, I think it was 357 uh, security, private security out of Russia, the best in the world. They are around him and his family protecting him because he can't trust the secret service. He can't trust the CIA. He can't trust the FBI and McCabe who's now been called on the carpet. He's having to testify. He's admitted that there was an absolute collusion between department of justice, uh, department of state, Homeland security, CIA, FBI, and everything to first of all, protect Clinton, everything, make sure she got elected. And then after that to, to take Trump out, and uh, there are people inside Secret Service, CIA, FBI, 
for sure in the Republican Party, all of those guys are bought and paid for. And uh, Paul Ryan is an absolute traitor and a criminal. He's been, uh, you know, he's met with Obama and the Antifa people secretly in Obama's home in uh, Washington, D.C. So he's an operative for Obama. And they keep trying to throw rocks at Russia, but Russia, you know, Putin is the only world leader that is defending Christianity, period. He's the only one. And uh, they keep throwing rocks at Russia. They keep trying to make Russia the bad guy. Russia's trying to do this. They came out this last week and said, Here's Russia trying to negotiate peace in North Korea, and Russia's the one supplied them with all their weapons. Not true. That's a, just an out-and-out, bold-faced lie. So, you know, the, the, the truth is out there. The problem is the media, bought and paid for by the Zionists, never discloses the truth. They disclo- disclose their agenda, their lies. Trump has a huge, huge job. It's a... You know, it's like the... It's not that, tripping a switch. No, the DIA agent that was in our home after he heard what we saw, he said, you know, he said, I feel so bad that the United States has done these things. He said, I, 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 he said, things have to change. But he said, you have to understand, this is a huge ship that's running in one direction. You can't turn it around overnight. It takes time. As the Libyans say to me, one by one, yeah. one by one. Now, here's the truth. If there was a government... That was that was run or controlled or, or owned, if you would, by a benevolent dictator, and benevolent is the key word there. That would be the very best possible type of government to have. You get rid of all the bureaucrats. Everything is done There's by no, a yeah no payoffs. Nobody can come in, and no company can come in and bribe somebody in Congress to get their bill passed, so they can have more money, so they can make more, and so it can. Nobody cares about what happens to anybody as long as these guys get their money and these guys get their contract. Yeah, that would be a great form of government. But, of course, you eliminate all the, the bureaucrats, and therein lies all the theft, collusion, uh, bribery, and everything else. Right. That's in the bureaucratic area. Just, just let me say that a benevolent dictator such as Hillary Clinton would not <laughs> <No>. work. <laughs> and no, she tried. Believe me, she tried. With Hillary yeah. Clinton. That was the whole plan, that she would be the only voice to have any say about anything. And as we know, had she won, we would know nothing about Uranium One. We would know nothing about Holder or or Obama. But, Bill, let me tell you why that's not true. Uranium One was a setup by the Russians. They were setting up. They were afraid the, the Zionists were going to absolutely get final and, and ultimate control of the United States, which would mean the demise of the world. There would be World War III. They, you know, the military industrial complex would be killing everybody and they would take the world down to a population of 500 million, which is their plan anyhow. Uranium One was a setup by the Russians, and they documented all of it. They set it up. They, they paid the bribes without Mueller question. Mueller was the, in, the guy. And, and that was a setup by Russia to take down the Zionists in the event that Hillary was elected. That was a anyway. genius act by the Russians. And that all see that what they have, the Russians have all the video, audio content of the entire negotiations. And when Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton are asking for these bribes themselves, and, Mueller, and, was and Mueller was involved. They got all this documented. So the Russians were going to be in a position to completely take down the Clinton-Bush cabal if needed. You know, we had some, some Russian uh, uh, journalists that we met in, in Libya in 2011. And they have told us, they say, you know, you're not going to hear the truth about Uranium One until it comes out that it was a setup. It was a stain put forward by Putin on the on the uh, Clintons. Clintons. Incorporate so many politicians and Obama stooges and Soros and all that. It includes all those guys. I, I really am overwhelmed with when it comes to God having a mission for me. I, I want to thank you so very much and we'll be in touch. You okay. bet. God bless, God bless you. you. Thank you so much. You're you're more than welcome. And God bless you and people Keep these people in your prayers. That's the only thing that has kept them alive till today.